and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. <coughs> Blessed, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all of your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Amen. And let us pray. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all of your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. We pray the prayer of the day. O Lord Jesus Christ, preserve the congregation of believers with your never-failing mercy. Help us to avoid whatever is wicked and harmful and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and you reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Our Old Testament lesson for this 15th Sunday after Pentecost is written in the prophecy of Jeremiah, chapter 15. Jeremiah talks about the cost of being a disciple. Um, his ministry was very hard, and he was persecuted by the people of Israel, and so he talks about that in the first paragraph, how hard it was for him, and even it gets to the point where he's questioning God's faithfulness to him. In the second paragraph, in the second part of this lesson, God comes to give him reassurance that he will always be with him. Lord, you understand. Remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me, and you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? You are to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and deliver you from the grasp of the cruel. This is our Old Testament lesson. Um, let's read responsibly Psalm 121. And this psalm, the Lord reminds us that he is always there to take care of us. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. You will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade and your brightness. 
The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let's rise for our Christmas lesson. Our epistle today is written in Paul's letter to the Romans, the 12th chapter. Here too, Paul talks about the cost of being a disciple. In the Old Testament, when the Israelites wanted to offer a sacrifice, they went and got an animal and they took it to the temple and they killed it. Then they went home. Now God says, I want all of you as a living sacrifice. Um, Jesus talks about laying down our life for him. Um, he also talks at the end about taking the spiritual gifts that God has given us and using them diligently for his service and for his people. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is our gospel lesson, and you may be seated for our next thing.
God, our Father, and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. The word of God that we look at today is our gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be? For a man, if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul, or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? This is the word of God. Thanks. The friends of Christ. We all know what sticker shock is, don't we? Let's say you want to get a newer car. Your old car is getting a lot of miles on it, it's getting kind of old, it's getting rattling, and kind of shaking, and once in a while you have to put some money on it to keep it going. So you say, I'm going to get a newer vehicle. I'm going to start looking around. So where do you look? Well, maybe you say to yourself, I'm going to go online. I'm going to check out some of the, the dealers online and see what it is. And so you start clicking around on your computer, and then you go, oh my goodness. Wow, I have no idea. This is the kind of money I would have put, put into it. I have no idea it was going to cost this much to get a newer vehicle. And so there you have it, sticker shock. The dictionary defines sticker shock as the shock or the sadness that a potential buyer has when they realize just how expensive this thing is that they want to buy. And, and we've all been there, right? Whether it's been vehicles or, or clothes or, or whatever it is. Now let's go to an imaginary scene up in heaven. The Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are talking about what is it going to take to save the world? They say, well, people of the world have sinned. They are doomed to suffer for their sins. And then the Father says to Jesus, Son, I want you to go down to earth and suffer and die for the people of the world. Can you imagine Jesus having sticker shock? Can you imagine Jesus going, oh my goodness, I had no idea this is what it was going to cost. I don't know that I want to do this because this is way too much. That's not what we would expect, is it? And in our text today, we hear Jesus say, this is what I have to do. This is the price I have to pay. And he's resigned to that. In our text this morning, we also hear Jesus say to us, this is what I want you to do. This is the cost that I want you to pay to be my disciples. And when we look at that cost, we see it's pretty big. What do you ask us to do? And so do we stop, suffer sticker shock then? Do we go, oh my goodness, I had no idea it was going to cost this much to be a disciple of Jesus. And so today, we want to look at that cost, consider that cost, and that's our theme for today. First of all, we consider the cost of what it took to be the Messiah come and die for our sins. And then secondly, we consider the cost of what it takes to be a disciple of the Messiah. So at the beginning of our text, Jesus talked about what it would cost him to be the Messiah. He says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now we're getting to the end of Jesus' ministry. Earlier in his ministry, even years before this, Jesus talked about some of this stuff, but it was in veiled references. For example, he said, uh, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. He was talking about his body. He said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so the Son of Man must be in the belly of the earth for three days. So again, talking about his resurrection, but as he's getting closer now to the end of his ministry, he comes right out and says, this is what is going to happen to me. I'm going to have to suffer and die on the cross. And I'm going to rise again. 
And there's at least twice more in Matthew where Jesus says very similar things as he's getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. And one of those times he even says, I have to die on the cross. Now why did Jesus say this to his disciples? Well, he wanted to prepare them for what is ahead. This is what is going to come. This is what I have to do. He wanted them to know ahead of time. Did it work? Did it help them? Well, it appears not so much. Right? It appears that, that they just didn't get it when Jesus said this. Evidence of that, Peter's comment back when Jesus says it. Another evidence of this is how the disciples acted on Easter Sunday. Jesus plainly said, I must, or I will rise from the dead. And it appears that they were clueless to that, that they weren't expecting that at all. And that even when the women came and said, we saw Jesus alive, they didn't believe the women. And so... It seems like it didn't really help them, and yet it did in the end, because later they could look back and they, oh yeah, he told us about this. He told us ahead of time, this is all what's going to happen. So he knew all along, of course, because he's the Messiah. He knew this. So Jesus told them what he had to do, and let's then go to Peter and his comment. Peter is suff suffering sticker shock, isn't he? Oh my goodness. That can't be. Lord, no, you can't suffer like this. Now his heart is in the right place, right? Because he loves Jesus and he doesn't want to see Jesus. But really, Peter, you're going to scold the Son of God. You're going to say to the Son of God, my plan for you is way better than your plan for you. And so I don't think you should, you should do your plans. He was thinking the things of men and not the things of God. The thinking of people in life is to try and avoid suffering at all costs. And the thinking of people for the Messiah is that he's the Messiah, so he should have a, a life of, of comfort and of glory. And so that's what Peter says to Jesus. This is, is what you should have. Now, in saying that, Peter is throwing up to Jesus the same temptation that the disciple had given Jesus years before this. Remember when, did I say disciples? The devil. When the devil, the temptation the devil had given to Jesus way before this. The devil took Jesus up on a high mountain and said, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, I'll give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. Basically saying, you don't have to suffer, Jesus. Don't worry about that, just worship me and you can have all this comfort and all this glory. And so Peter is saying the same thing. You don't have to suffer, Jesus. We'll work something else out. So you don't have to do that. Now Peter's not realizing it. But if he could have succeeded in giving Jesus to in getting Jesus to give up his suffering, then his own salvation would be in jeopardy. He wouldn't be saved. None of us would be saved if Jesus gave up his suffering. That's why Jesus had to speak so sharply to him. That's why Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan. He had to call him Satan because this was a temptation of the devil. And so he says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, a trap to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And so the thinking of God is that there's more important things in life than avoiding suffering and looking for comfort. There's more important things than that, like sacrificing yourself for the sins of the world. And so Jesus knew the cost, and he was willing to pay the cost. There was not sticker shock here. We don't hear that. Just the opposite. But if only there could be another way. What if someone could gain the whole world? Could they then pay for their soul? Some people have gained a lot. Right? There's a lot of rich people in the world today. In history, there's people who have gained a lot. Let's just pick out, for example, Alexander the Great, who lived a little bit before Jesus was born. And he was from Greece, and he succeeded in conquering all of Greece, and then came across and, and conquered all of Turkey, and then came down and, and conquered the Persian Empire and the Holy Land and went over to Egypt and conquered them and then he was on his way east to India and was going to take all that territory and then he died a pretty early death. Now let's suppose that Alexander the Great is standing before God and he says, Lord, let's make a deal. I'll give you all the lands I conquered and all of the possessions and all of the wealth 
that I conquered if you let me into heaven. Do we have a deal? What would God say? He would say, no deal, right? First of all, I own all this. I made it all. I created it. I just gave it to you to use for a little while, so you can't give it back to me. But even if you did own all of this, no deal, because it's not enough to pay for your soul. Jesus said, even if you would gain the whole world, what would it profit you? Because it had to be Jesus. It had to be the blood of the Son of God. But isn't it curious then that so many people come to God and try to offer Him much less than that. They come with, with a life of, of trying to do good, a life of kind of good works, and say, here God, I, I tried. Will you let me into heaven? It just doesn't cut it, does it? It has to be Jesus. It has to be blood. And so Jesus knew he had to die. He knew who would kill him. He says the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, he knew exactly who would be behind it. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him. He says, suffer many things and die. As I mentioned another time, he said he would have to die on the cross. So he knew that. He knew that he would be forsaken by his father to pay for the sins of the world. And so he said, I, I must die. This is what I have to do. And, and he really had to do it, didn't he? Because, after all, he was captured and tortured. When Judas brought the soldiers to the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a small army. There's no way that Jesus could get out of that. And so then they tied him up, and they chained him, and they took him off to Caiaphas and Annas, and and Herod and Pilate, he went from one to the other. All the time the soldiers were there around him and they had him chained up and when they were beating him and whipping him and mocking him, he could not overpower them because they were all there. And then when they took him and nailed him to the cross, there's no way to get out of that, right? So he, he had to die because this is the way it was. And yet... Jesus said to his disciples in the garden when they were capturing me, he said, I could <coughs> pray to God and have thousands of angels here in a second. He said to Caiaphas, the time is coming when we, you will see me coming in the clouds with the angels of power and great glory because I'm the Son of God. He said to Pilate, who was in control of all the Roman soldiers, he said, you have no power on your own. The only power you have is given to you by God. And so he could have walked away at any time, right? He could have just broken those tiny little ropes and those pitiful little chains and walked away. Especially when one of his own disciples betrays him. And one of his own disciples says, I don't know him, I want nothing to do with him. Wouldn't you be tempted just to walk away? Especially when your own people, the people you came to die for, say, crucify him, crucify him. And especially when you look ahead in the history of the world and you know that all of us are going to sin against him. And so wouldn't it be tempting just to say, I quit, I'm done, I'm not going to do this. But he didn't, did he? And it says he couldn't. He says it was necessary for him. I must die. I must be captured. Those are the words he uses. He knew he had to do this. And why did he have to do this? It was his love. That's the only explanation. That's how much he loves us. And he put himself through all of that. No sticker shock, no backing out. He was willing to pay the price. And so then he says to us, if you want to be my follower, if you want to be my disciple, then... I would like you to pay the cost. And consider the cost. And so he says to us today, will you, will you do it? Will you pay the price? Now we may be thinking, oh wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought salvation is free. I thought there's no price you have to pay to get into heaven. No price you have to pay for the forgiveness of sins. And that's true. Right? Salvation is a free gift. The gift of faith is a free gift. There's nothing we have to do to be a believer, to be in heaven. But it wasn't free for Jesus, was it? It cost him his life. 
And so today, what he's saying is if you want to, out of gratitude for that, out of love for me, if you want to be a follower, a disciple, then consider giving, paying this cost. And what is the cost? That's the price. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. So the cost, he says, deny yourself. Your selfishness, your selfish thinking, your old Adam, deny that, say no to that, throw that away. Take up your cross. Just as I took up my cross and, and suffered for you, so you take up your cross and, and suffer for me. And then be willing to lose your life. As Paul talks about living sacrifice, he says, be willing to give up anything and everything for me and be willing to lose your life. That's a, that's a lot, right? That sticker shot. Wow. Although we may be thinking to ourselves, well, wow, nowadays it's not such a big deal because the threat of us actually getting arrested and having the government take our possessions away and put us in jail, that really doesn't happen in America. We have freedom of religion. The threat of someone actually coming and killing us because we're a disciple of Jesus, that isn't really going to happen. And so being a follower, taking up our cross, not such a big deal, pretty easy piece of cake, right? But Jesus here is not just talking about getting beat up. He's not just talking about being put in jail. He's not just talking about dying for him. But he's talking about much more. When he says the things of God, the thinking of God versus the thinking of mankind. The thinking of humans, as we said, is to avoid suffering at all costs and to try and have a comfortable life. The thinking of God is that there's more important things than avoiding suffering. There's more important things than having a comfortable life for yourself. And so it comes down to priorities. It comes down to what is most important in my life. And it comes down to love. It comes down to who is most important in my life. For example, Jesus says, deny yourself. Do we rely First of all, on ourselves, to get through from day to day. Do we trust in our own resources, our own thinking, our own smarts, our own guts, our own strength to get by? Or do we toss that aside and rely first on Jesus and put our trust in Him first of all for things? Do we try and promote ourselves and our glory? Or are we more interested in promoting the glory of Jesus? Are we thinking just about saving our life? Saving our life so we can have a richer, fuller life? Or are we willing to give up so that we can help others in their lives? Are we all turned inward? Now, what's going on with us? Are we looking out? Are we willing to... We work, always work so hard to be comfortable? Or are we willing to be uncomfortable to help people around us? Are we thinking about making our life easy or are we willing to kind of roll up our sleeves and do the hard work of loving one another, being there for one another, helping one another? We look at the cost. Jesus is asking a lot, isn't he? He's asking us to live our whole life for him and for one another. We look at the cost, but we look at love. Because there it all comes together and there is the answer. Jesus knew that he was loved by his Father. And so he came down here and obeyed his Father and gave himself for us because he loved us. And so we are loved by Jesus. And we know how he loved us by dying for us. And so he says to us, since I have so loved you, may you love one another. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's join in confessing our faith. We use the words of the Nicene Creed that are printed in the
We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified and unconscious alive. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who is indeed with the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. O Lord our God, we come to you with hearts filled with gratitude and praise. For the light of another day, we give you thanks for making us your children through Jesus. We praise your holy name for forgiving us our sins and for giving us your word as a source of our joy, accept our praise. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that in spite of all your loving kindness to us, we have often brought about discredit to your holy name. We have often failed in our worship by permitting ourselves to be conformed to this world. We sometimes forget that while we are being members of your body, we are one body in Christ. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, we have sometimes failed to use these gifts for the best interest of your kingdom. For these many neglects, forgive us, O Lord, and send us your Holy Spirit, that as members of your body we may fulfill our purpose with greater zeal. We ask these petitions in the name and for the sake of him who deny himself and suffered for us that he might save us. And in his name we pray for our communicants. Dear God in heaven, as we partake of the Lord's table, may we receive with true faith the seal and the guarantee of your forgiveness, the very body and blood of our Savior, once offered on the cross, now given here in bread and wine. As we receive this divine pledge of pardon, strengthen our faith, soothe our wounded consciences, and deepen our love for you and help us to respond to your holy will with more perfect obedience. To this end, bless our hearts with the gift of the Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of your dear Son, our only Savior, and we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> we continue with the service of Holy Communion.